Hello and welcome to Study and Share. We're so glad that you're with us. If I haven't had the privilege of meeting you yet, my name is Liz Rodriguez and I'm the new director of women's ministry here at Calvary Church in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And we're so excited about this semester. We are diving in to a topic that we all need to engage in. And I remember the first time I heard the word theology. I was a first year student at Dallas Seminary and they told me I had to take theology classes. And I told them I didn't want to take theology classes, that I actually just wanted to study the Bible. And they politely informed me that that wasn't an option and that I needed to take theology classes. And I was sitting there day one with my professor, Dr. Kreider. I'll never forget it. And at the very beginning, he gently reminded us that if we engage in scripture, we're all theologians. And that really hit me as someone who loves to study God's word, to take on the title of theologian seemed mighty and weighty and like something I wasn't sure I wanted to be a part of. But as I've dived into scripture more and more and began to see the value of firmly understanding what we believe and why we believe it, I know that we all engage with theology every day. And I'm excited to see what God does in and through our lives this semester as we see how these eight core theology topics impact our faith and therefore impact our daily lives. So there's a few things you need to know before we get started. One, the hope and prayer of study and share is for three things to happen. The first one is that we would learn in-depth Bible study skills. And so you're going to see from our teachers to our discussion points that we want you to walk away from these 15 weeks with skills needed in order to dive into scripture and be able to understand it for yourself. Yourself. The second thing is we want you to experience interactive learning. And so this semester, you're going to see teaching. You're going to see some conversations about how these theology topics impact our personal lives. And then you're also going to have the opportunity to talk with your groups about what you've learned, but also how it is actually impacting your day-to-day -day life. And the last one is that you would engage in intergenerational relationships. So whether that's through your group, whether it's in person or online, our hope is that we're surrounding ourselves with women of all ages, of all different backgrounds, so that we can learn from everyone along the way. There's a few things that you can expect to see this semester. The first one is if you didn't know, we're doing Everyday Theology by Mary Wiley. We ask that you order the book on Amazon or wherever you purchase your books. You're feel, feel free to go ahead and order that if you haven't done so already. Um, and the rhythm for this semester is that there's going to be some teaching, there's going to be some homework, some discussion points, and then obviously we'll wrap up with prayer. But one of the things that I'm excited about is that in the teaching on week two of Everyday Every week's lesson, you're going to get to be a part of a conversation that me and the teacher will be having about what does it look like for scripture or the Holy Spirit or the end times or the Trinity to impact our daily lives. How are the decisions we're making, the thoughts we're having, the conversations and the words we're speaking affected by the theology that we believe? Also, just so you know, the teaching will be online by 9.30 on Tuesday mornings. You can find it at calvarychurch.org slash women. You can also find it on our YouTube and Facebook page if you search Calvary Church and look for the logo. That logo is important, okay? Look for the green C. You can click on it. You'll be able to find all of our teaching lessons there, 9.30 Tuesday morning. So if you're engaging online with us, whether that's in a created group or a group of your friends, be sure that you look there and you can find us. There's also a few different ways that we're gathering together this semester. We're still um, in this crazy season of life, and so we wanted to provide as many opportunities as possible for you to engage in study and share this semester. And so the first way is in person. Maybe you're watching this um, Tuesday mornings or Wednesday evenings here at Calvary Church. Um, the other way is a self-created group. You've gathered with some friends and said, you know what? We, I've got a group of girlfriends. We'd love to do this study together. We're going to make our own arrangements. We're going to decide our own times. You've got yourself a group. The third way is a digital group that we've helped you create. So we've gathered a group of ladies who we knew were interested in an online group in the morning, and we've said, here you go. So whichever way you signed up for, you've gotten some information about that. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me at lrodriguez, R-O-D-R-I-G-U-E-Z, at calvarychurch.org. I would love to make sure you get connected. It is our heart and our prayer that these groups are going strong and that they're going well 
And so if as you're getting connected, you're like, the day and time's not working, something comes up, please let me know. Shoot me an email. We'd love to get you connected in the best way that seems possible. Another thing for you to be aware of is we are splitting up the homework, which personally I love because sometimes in five days worth of homework, it's just a lot of homework. So this is going to give you ample amount of time to work through it, to digest it, to pray and process through what you're learning. So we're taking one week's worth of the book homework and we're splitting it into two weeks of actual in-person homework and teaching. So for example, in just a moment, you're going to hear from our teacher, Beth. She's going to be teaching scripture week one which is why we asked you to do days one and two of the homework. And then next week, you're going to hear from Beth again as she wraps up the scripture lesson and you complete the homework for the week. So just so you know, we've got a document that lays it out great. You can find it on our website, calvarychurch.org slash women. It has all of the details there for you so you know when you're doing what homework, what homework you're doing, what lesson we're on. It gives you all of the details there. So be sure to check that out. You're probably going to want to download it, Make it small, slip it in your book so you've got all of the things needed. And ladies, over these next few weeks, we're going to be diving in to eight topics and how they affect our daily lives. As I've geared up for this semester, as I began praying for us and what God's going to call us to do, I just have really begged and beseeched God to give us wisdom to how theology affects our lives. We're all theologians, whether we want to be considered one or not. As we engage in scripture, we are diving into these deep topics and they all affect us. I'm so eager to hear what Beth is going to say about scripture because what we believe about scripture impacts our decision making, it impacts our lives, it impacts our thought processes, our actions. Everything we do is impacted by what we believe on these topics. And so over these next many weeks together, we're going to dive deep into what scripture teaches us on all of these topics and how they're impacting us. That's really our heart, is that this wouldn't just be head knowledge that we're taking in, but rather it would be knowledge that we're living out that's transforming our lives because of the information that we're learning, and more importantly, because of the God we serve, that everything we're learning is for his glory and for his namesake. I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to dive into week one. God, we come before you with expectancy for what's to come this semester, God. We give you the spring semester, Father, these weeks, our groups, our leaders, Father, and we just ask for wisdom and insight and discernment into all that you have coming our way this semester, Father. We ask that you would go before us and prepare our hearts and minds for what it is that you want us to learn. That as we engage with these topics and these pillars of our faith, Father, that that we would be cultivated, that our beliefs would be strengthened, that the foundation with which we stand on would be made stronger, God. We pray um, that as the worship happens and as these teaching moments happens, God, that our eyes, ears, and hearts would be open to all that you have to say. That it wouldn't be the teacher speaking, Father, but that it would be you speaking through them and that we would be prepared for what it is that you want us to learn today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hi, ladies. Would you join with us in worshiping the Lord today? This world may resound with God's own heart. 
for the work that it's doing in our hearts. And Lord, we have asked you already to speak to us, to plant your word deep in us, Lord, so that we can become more like you, Lord, that the earth would be filled with your glory, Lord, through us. And we just ask these things in your name. Amen. Welcome, ladies. My name is Beth Buckwalter, and I'm so honored to be the first to share with you this, this semester as we open up everyday theology, what you believe matters. And I am so excited, and I think I can speak for the entire teaching team when I say I'm so excited about this study because it's so important that we as Christians understand what we believe because we don't want to just practice an empty Christian religion. No, we want to have a living, active relationship with an all-powerful God who loves us absolutely and truly desires for us to know him and have a relationship with him. And so we're going to be learning about that this semester. We're gonna be learning how that happens and how we can embrace it and practice it and live it out. It's not enough to just read it and learn about it, but we need to do it. We need to make it fill us. And I know, as Liz said, theology can sometimes be a scary term. I know I always kind of thought, oh, theology, that's stiff and boring. And it just didn't interest me or excite me. Well, when I was in college, that was one of our core classes. We had to select a theology class. And I thought, oh, oh, great. Okay. 
let's get this out of the way and let's make sure it's the class that I can sleep in a little bit and the one that's a little bit shorter in length. I know it sounds horrible, but <laughs> that's, that's how I chose my class. And ladies, let me tell you, the first day I sat in that room, I thought, wow, was I wrong? It was fascinating. And as someone who grew up in the church, I grew up in the mission field, so I knew the Bible. But to actually dig in and study theology and learn why we believe what we believe, it was mind blowing. And so that's my prayer for us this semester is that we are going to understand scripture and understand God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and salvation and the church and all these things that we're going to understand them in a deeper, richer way that excites us and makes us want to go out and share our excitement with others. Now, if we're studying theology, which is the study of God and God's relation to us, then why aren't we just diving in? I mean, why isn't the first chapter about God, right? Why is it scripture? Well, the first chapter is about God because it's talking about one of the two ways that God has chosen to reveal himself to us. And that's scripture, the Bible, God's word. So I wanna take a few minutes to think about why does scripture matter? Well, first of all, it was his way of revealing himself to us. Through the Bible, we know who he is. We know what he wants us to believe about him. We know what's true about him. And we know how he wants us to respond accordingly. In Isaiah, God tells Isaiah, he said, Remember the former things of old, for I am God. There is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. Through the prophets, God is telling us that he is all-knowing, he is all-powerful, he's the creator of the universe, and ultimately, he's the savior of the world. And he, the creator of the universe, ladies, he wants us to know him. Who are we? What is man that he is mindful of him? The son of man that he created him. Who are we? And yet that's what he desires from us because he also gave us scripture to communicate with us. He wants relationship. He wants to commune with us. That should be the most encouraging gift you ever, ever hear. And this is why we have to start with scripture because scripture is the basis for understanding all of these things. The author of Hebrews writes, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. When God spoke to them, they wrote it down. They recorded it in the scriptures. And we know this as the Old Testament. And then he says, but in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son. That's the other way that he has chosen to reveal himself to us through Jesus, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Now, the writings of scripture after Jesus came, after he sent his son, that's the New Testament. And in the Gospels, that's where he, um, he inspired people to tell us the story of Jesus to tell us Jesus' words, to tell us Jesus' actions, to tell us um, what he stood for. And in Matthew and Mark, we don't have a specific reason that they give for, for writing, other than we know that it was God breathed. But in Luke, he tells us that he writes to Theophilus and he says, I write this so that you can know that what you have been taught and what you believe is true. And John tells us that John writes these things so that we can believe them. 
and believing will give us eternal life in Jesus. So they've given us the scriptures through the gospels, through Jesus' life, and then they give us the epistles, which is an instruction manual, basically, for how we're meant to live. It's an encouragement, an instruction. Um, Paul tells us a little bit about more about scripture and the nature of scripture when he's writing his letter to Timothy, just by way of a little context. Here, he, Paul, has been contrasting Timothy with those who are always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. So people who are searching, but it's all head knowledge and they never really understand it. We don't want to be that way, okay? He's also contrasting Timothy with those who oppose the truth, are corrupted in mind, and are disqualified regarding the faith. That's the context. That's what he's saying. Okay, these are the people that I do not want you to be like. So he contrasts, he says, but as for you, as for Timothy and ladies, that my prayer is that it'll be as for us too. Continue in what you learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. God wants us to know him. So through the sacred writings, through scripture, he is able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. If he wants a relationship with us, then he had to make a way for us to know and understand it, a way that pointed to Christ before Christ came a way that carries us through after Christ um, ascended back to heaven. And then he says, this is where scripture comes from. It's not just us getting like, ooh, I know what I want to write about today. No, it is breathed out by God. In some translations it says God breathed, but literally it just means breathed out by God. And why? It's so we can be taught his ways. It's so that we can be corrected. It's so when we are going in the wrong way, he can chasten us and discipline us, not out of some mean need for control, but no, because he loves us. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, is what he writes in in Revelation. He wants us to know the right way to live. He wants us to know the way that he created us to be. That is his desire. He wants perfection for us, but he doesn't necessarily expect us to achieve that perfection on our own because we can't. By God's grace, by God's grace, he gave us the Bible so we know that we can't do it on our own. We can't just keep working and, oh, maybe I can just, oh, if I just do this one good deed, if I just pay a little bit more money to this charity, if, if I just watch my language a little bit more, then, then God will love me. Then that'll be enough. No. By God's grace, he gives us scripture to say, it's not enough. It'll never be enough. Jesus, Jesus is enough. And that's why we study theology. It also brings us to a third reason why God gave us scripture. It reveals our desperate need of a savior. I'm assuming that you're similar to me in this because I'm very, very guilty. But I know that I have a natural propensity for making myself look better, look more morally polished, than I actually am. It's so easy for me to compare myself to others. Well, at least I'm not that bad. <laughs> at least I didn't do that. You know, I'm, I'm okay. You know, we're, I'm getting there. I'm, I'm doing the best I can. Um, 
maybe I'm just going to gossip about this person so I feel better about myself. Or maybe I'm going to promote something that I did so that I feel better about what I'm doing. No, ladies, it's never going to be good enough. Scripture shows us that we can't do it on our own. Hebrews writes, or the author of Hebrews writes, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the uh, thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Wow. (laughs) The Bible is not some archaic self-help book. It is living and active. Sharper than any two-edged sword. It's relevant today. It's important now, not just thousands of years ago. Now, we need to live it out today. And what a picture. A double-edged sword piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. This goes back to what Jesus was talking about in the Sermon on the Mount. Of course we're sinful people because we're sinful deep down in our hearts. It's not just our actions. It's our thoughts. It's our mindset. I know that I'm convicted of this all the time. When my children are starting to get a little irritating and I'm trying to do something. Maybe I'm trying to wash the dishes or maybe I'm trying to work on this lesson. And mommy, mommy, can you read me the story? Which I love reading to my kids. So that's kind of my weakness. I'm like, sure, <laughs> let me just put this down. But, or mommy, mommy, um, Will is hitting me or mommy, mommy, I need this. Or can you make me a train track? That's, that's a popular one with, with my son. And I have less than honorable thoughts in that moment. I have selfish motives. I'm like, oh, I really don't want to make another train track that's going to litter the, the living room. And when I think those things, I'm reminded, I'm like, oh, I am sinning in my heart because I am putting myself above other people. And it's scripture that reminds me of that. It's scripture and my knowledge of scripture that gets me back on track. I wish I could say that I was always obedient and I didn't, you know, the self didn't win out. Um, But that would not be true, unfortunately. But this last part, no creature is hidden from his sight. We can't hide from God. But all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Our judge sees all. He knows all. That's a terrifying thought. But God. And ladies, this is why we study theology, because we have to know the whole story. The whole story, all the context should not scare us, but instead it should call us to rejoice in what he has done and his eternal, amazing, perfect rescue plan because he loves us and he desires for us to know him. And this is one of the reasons I'm so excited for all of us. I'm so excited to dig in and to learn more about that big picture. It's so important. But how do we know that God's word is true? Well, there are external reasons, you know, that that we can, that support the fact that it's true because we have one united story from the beginning of time, Genesis 3, all the way through scripture. And it was Genesis 3, um, 
says that basically from, from that day, it says that Jesus is going to triumph over Satan, the serpent. It said he will um, crush his head and the snake will strike his heel. And so right then, it's telling us from the beginning that there's this battle. And so all throughout scripture, remember, years have passed. They've traveled around a whole region. They did not have email. They did not have telephones. They couldn't just pick up the, you know, get on a high-speed train and say, oh, here, um, let's have a meeting and let's, let's talk about how we're going to, you know, de- defend this, this God who supposedly exists. No, we have all these different examples throughout time and they're collected in over 25,000 manuscripts, original manuscripts that support the truth of scripture. I can tell you, if this was not God-breathed, if this were not inspired, then why would there be a reason? Why would there be a reason for 25,000 manuscripts to be saved over thousands of years? How would there be one consistent, cohesive story that all fits together, all these prophecies that are ultimately fulfilled in Christ Jesus. And then we have the internal sources. We have the Bible itself and all the ways, all the times it talks about the truth of scripture. Jesus himself talked about even the Psalms he referred to as scripture. He talked about the prophets. He talked talked about the law. He talked about the Psalms needed to be fulfilled through him. All of those things point back to scripture. Jesus recognized this as truth of scripture. In the Psalms, um, David writes, Your righteousness is righteousness forever, and your law is truth. The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. Psalm 119 is about the Bible. It's about delighting in Scripture and talking about how God's word is truth. And not only is God's word true, but it is also eternal. So notice, your righteousness is righteousness forever and your law is truth. The sum of your, tr- your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. In Isaiah 48, it talks about the grass withers, the flower fades, and the word of our God will stand forever. It's going to last. It's not temporary. It's not something, like I said, that is archaic. No, it's alive now, forever. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words, Jesus is saying here, my words will not pass away. Now again, because we're studying theology, we'll get to the importance of him saying this in a few weeks. What's he saying here? If we know that God's word will stand forever and Jesus says, my words will not pass away, Jesus is saying that he's God and his words are scripture. Now, sadly, today, um, there are a lot of people who profess to be Christians who don't believe that everything in the Bible is true. They don't believe that everything in the Bible is forever. They don't believe that all things that God t- preaches and, and that, um, that Jesus spoke about, they don't believe that that necessarily is happening or relevant now and today. And this breaks my heart. But it's important to know that even Peter, an apostle of Jesus, he points us to the fact that we can trust everything, including the Pauline letters and the other epistles in in the New Testament. Because it's easy to say, oh yes, well, if Jesus said it, then, then sure, it's true. But some people think, okay, so I'll I'll just focus on what Jesus said. I'll just focus on his words. I'll just focus on the gospel. But I don't really think that a lot of the information in the letters that Paul wrote or the letters that John wrote or Peter himself wrote, I I don't know if, if, 
I like everything that they say. And so since Jesus didn't say it, then how am I supposed to know that, you know, that this wasn't just something that Paul made up on the fly? Well, check this out. Peter writes, And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you, according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the air of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. According to the wisdom given him. Who gave him that wisdom? Well, God did, because all scripture is breathed out by God. All scripture, including Paul, his writings. And then, if you keep going, it says, as they do the other scriptures. When Peter talks about the other scriptures, that's implying that Paul is also considered scripture, that his writings, his letters, they're God-breathed, and they're also considered scriptures. It's so important to know your Bible. So when people try to convince you that parts of the Bible aren't true, or maybe parts of the Bible don't matter quite as much, we need to know this. We need to know this so that we can defend and say, yes, it is. <laughs> of course it is. Because God gave him the wisdom to write. He told Paul what he wanted to write. Of course, it's all in, in the writer's style, whether it's Paul's style or John's style and Peter's style. Uh, we all see that, that everyone has their unique personalities that shine through. There are different methods of, of writing. Um, John has a very circular writing style. Paul is more direct. But the meat is from God. The message is from God. But why does it matter that we believe that God's word is true? Why is it important? To doubt the inerrancy of scripture is to doubt the nature of God. He is truth. His word is true. Jesus himself tells us so. In his high priestly prayer right before he died, Jesus said, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Jesus, the person who's considered the ultimate authority in the gospels, in, in scripture, he is saying that God's word is truth. And then in Revelation, it says, And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down. That's scripture. For these words are trustworthy and true. Remember Paul's warning? Since there are some things in the scriptures that are hard to understand, and since the ignorant and unstable twist them to their own destruction, what does he say? He urges us, he says, take care that you are not carried away by the error of lawless people and therefore lose your own stability. Ladies, it's all around us. It's happening. It doesn't matter if you are adding to scripture through legalism. It doesn't matter if you're taking away. 
our faith erodes when we can't trust its foundation. When we set ourselves up as little gods, picking and choosing what we want to believe, that is a dangerous, dangerous game. But what does he tell us? What does he tell us? If we're not supposed to get carried away with the error, what what are we supposed to do instead? We're supposed to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How do we do that? How do we do it? We study scripture. We study his word. That's how we stay focused. I love this line from our book, from Everyday Theology. It says, if we love God without loving God's word, we don't really know the object of our affection. We may bow to a God that we've created in our heads, a God that we want him to look like, a God that suits our purposes, a God that suits our selfish agenda, instead of knowing the true God of scripture. This is something that I pray against all the time because I know the danger. I know how easy it can be to say, oh yeah, I know scripture. Oh yeah, I I know this. But ladies, I don't know if you've noticed, but there is a lot of noise in our world. It's coming from the left and it's coming from the right. And I pray all the time, Lord, please, in the words of King Jehoshaphat, I don't know what to do, so my eyes are on you. And my eyes are on God through scripture, through his word. And I wish I could say that I was always faithfully learning from scripture. I wish I could say that that was always the first thing on my to-do list for the day. But it's not. It's not always. And that's why I value places like Study and Share. That's why I value Bible studies and accountability partners and people who will point me back to the truth. People who will point me back to scripture. Because that's what matters. That's what he's given us so that we know more about him. So then why do we focus on scripture first? Because scripture alone, scripture alone, not looking elsewhere, but looking to the Bible as the authoritative source for our theology. I'm not saying it's not good to read other books that point us to Christ. I'm saying when we are studying theology, this is our book. Because if we don't know scripture, if we're not rooted and anchored in God's truth, then we could read a book and say, oh, well, that's about scripture. That sounds really good. Oh, yeah, I believe that. Or, oh, well, that's... And how easily can we be led away? How easily can we be confused if we are not in step with the word of God, the eternal, truthful word of God? We have to know. We have to understand the scriptures. We have to study the scriptures so we know whether what we're reading about God is pointing us to him or leading us away from him. And ladies, we need to run. We need to run if it's pointing the other direction and pulling us from him instead of bringing us closer to be with him, to commune with him. And so if I can leave you with one thing, one thing, this would be it. Because scripture, God's word, it's timeless. And it is relevant. And it is meaningful and necessary. And it is true. God's word is true. We can't hope to know our all-knowing, all-powerful God if we don't know 
the scripture that he gave us to reveal himself to us. If we're not making it an active part of our lives. So I want to take a few minutes. You can pause the the video if you need to. But I want to take a few minutes just so you can think. Bow before God and ask him, how am I allowing scripture to play an active role in my life so that I can be complete, equipped for every good work? He's prepared good works in advance for us, ladies. So how are we allowing scripture to play an active role? Just take a minute, close your eyes, and talk to God. Dear Lord, we love you. And I, I can't even understand why you would choose us. People who reject you on a daily basis by promoting the God of self, by promoting the God of comfort, by promoting the God of, of our own agendas, by promoting the God of stuff, all these inferior, worthless, false gods, Lord. Yet you love us. And you desire to have a relationship with us to the point that you gave us your word. You gave us the gift of your word so that we can know and understand you better, Lord, so that, so that we can know what you desire life to look like for us so that we can know Jesus who saves us from ourselves, so that we know that the only way that we can have a relationship with you is through him and through his grace and his mercy and his truth. And Lord, we thank you for these gifts. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your son. We thank you for your desire for us to know you. And Lord, I just pray that this semester that we can hear from you, that we can dig into your scriptures, that we can learn from them and see you and love you in an even deeper way than we have before. And I pray all these things in your precious name. Amen. For a prayer prompt with your group, I ask that you pray that the women in your group will have a deeper understanding of the scriptures so that we can bear fruit in every good work and increase in the knowledge of God. I hope that sounds familiar to some of you who were here when we studied Colossians because we prayed the entirety of this prayer a lot for our groups. So I'd ask that you'd pray that again for each other today. And then I ask that you discuss how has the Bible taught, rebuked, corrected, or trained you? And how have you seen the truth of God's word stand up over time? How is it meaningful and real in your life? And just in preparation for next week, I also want you to think about what are some of your favorite scriptures that always come, come back to you? Um, maybe, maybe you just have a special connection to them. Or maybe it's something that is always convicting you, that you're always reminded of. Um, but just think about some of those because next week I'm going to be back and I'm going to be talking a little bit about what it means to delight in Scripture and what it means to have Scripture be an active part of your life so that we can be doers and not hearers only. Thank you. <laughs>